looking, I was listening to the radio this morning, and um, there was a fellow on the radio, and he was talking about having gone to uh, a banquet or something where they were honoring these children who had the serious diseases they were trying to raise money for. And he was talking about, you know, how some kids get are, are born with these terrible things and how unfair it is. And, you know, he, he said when you think you're in charge, you realize that, you know, only God is in this kind of business. But, you know, I was thinking uh, as I listened about <coughs> the years, of, well, <coughs> ages of DNA mutations that have happened as a result of in some way not understanding the way life should be carried out. And it happens right up to this day. One of the greatest uh, things that I've had, we've had happen to us recently was to go to a veterinarian in New York and uh, you know, we told him we had a little dog had cancer. And the first thing he did was say, do not feed that animal dog food. He says, and the reason the dogs get cancer and the reason they get kidney disease, and this would go for cats or anything else, is because of the food. Because of this processed food, and that's what causes it. So, of course, we, we changed, and uh, they no longer get commercial processed dog food. But how many thousands of years have we been doing things because we did not understand the directions? It's like anything else. If you you know, going to hook up an appliance or if you're going to try to fix something. If you don't follow the directions, and I'm all, always guilty of that. I never, I just, you know, figure, well, I should be able to screw something. And I usually do screw something. You know, I screw something up. But, I mean, I don't read directions. And uh, trouble happens. Well, here we have a situation where for thousands of years the directions that we have been given have been misinterpreted. And let me give, give you, we'll show you real quick and then we'll go on. Uh, if you'll put in overhead uh, 566, I put these on, but there's a lot more of these. And I, and I guess I'll have to collect other ones. Maybe if you and you have a, an opportunity. Uh, Psalm 78, I will open my mouth in a parable, I'll utter dark sayings. This is the Bible saying, when you're reading this stuff, these are parables, these are symbolic stories, they're dark sayings, they have hidden meanings to them. Don't read them literally. It, it tells you about wisdom in Proverbs 1 6. It says, if you understand a proverb and its interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. In other words, again, they mean something other than what they say. So don't interpret them literally. In Matthew 13, it says that Jesus spoke parables and, and never spoke without a parable, meaning it's all symbolic, it all means something else. 2 Corinthians said, we're ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So he says, for the letter kills, and we see it all the time. You know, bombs drop, people fly planes and airplanes because they hate each other over these words that they don't understand. So he says, you don't, you don't take this stuff literally. And that's what it says. It's, it's very clear that you do not take the letter. You don't take it literally. Romans 2.29, he's a Jew which is one inwardly and in circumcision is of the heart. And this is a monumental statement in the Bible that a Jew is not a human being, not a person, but an inner entity, an inner energy, an inner spirit. Uh, that's what a Jew is. It is one who dwells at the right side, as we talked about. But you know, there's another interesting thing. When you see this, you say, well, a Jew means something inside of us, not a person. And then you see, like, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That's what they put on the cross. And it takes the whole thing. Well, not king of a, of a race of people that live in the Middle East, but king of everybody that dwell inside of themselves at the right side. It, you know, changes the whole thing. 2 Corinthians 3.15, when Moses is read even to this day, the veil is on their heart. In other words, people read it literally. And they have to turn to the Lord, which is mean meditation, meditating. To, so that you understand that you have a clarity and, you, and, and, and the veil is taken away, that the, the hidden meaning uh, comes to you. Uh, the most, uh, Acts 7.48, the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands, and yet we've fought and fought for ages over these buildings. But it's not that. The temple not made with hands 
is here on your shoulders. It's your head. It's your mind. It's your brain. Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. In other words, it's an inner force inside of people. That's, that's, that's how we begin to understand all of this. And it's been so hard because the religions of the world want to interpret it literally because their kingdoms are made of money and buildings and, 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 and people and robes and all this stuff. And that's not what it is. 1 Corinthians 3.16, you are the temple of God. The temple is holy. Which temple? You are. See? So it's talking about us. It's talking about inside of you. And then in Galatians, it's talking about uh, the story of Abraham and Sarah. It's, it's an allegory. It doesn't mean what it says. These people didn't even exist. There are two covenants, Mount Sinai, and which genders the bondage, and that's Agar, and the other one's Jerusalem. Mount Sinai, there is no such place, never was. Sorry. And so, all of these things we understand are mythological things. They're talking about the movement inside of us to connect with that which is a higher consciousness, a, a higher realm, a, 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 another way of understanding life in and of itself. See? So, so we look at all of these different things, and we find all of these things are symbolic, and we find the Bible telling us that it's symbolism. The Bible is telling us that it's allegory. The Bible is telling us, no, we're not talking about a temple or a church. We're talking about you. The Bible is telling us that when you read the Old Testament, it's symbolic. Just move that down. The Bible is telling us that a Jew is one inside, not outside. It's something's very, very special. Everybody strives to be a Jew because you're, that means you're positioning yourself at the right side. The Bible says that Jesus never spoke but in parables and that the Old Testament is parables and dark sayings. So it's telling you it's all symbolic. And let's look at something else that's very interesting in Overhead 165 that we looked at. This is from Tel Aviv University. Tel Aviv University in the middle of Israel. Professor Zev Herzog of Tel Aviv, the many Egyptian documents known to us do not make any reference to the children of Israel or the events in the Exodus. They've tried to locate Mount Sinai and the stations of the tribes in the desert, but despite all this diligent research, not one site was identified that could correspond to the biblical picture. This isn't coming from some New Age thing. or from some, This is coming from Tel Aviv University in Tel Aviv, Israel. This is about Jericho and Joshua. During the period when the conquest would have taken place, there were no cities there, so there couldn't have been any walls. So it means something else. There's a Jericho inside of everybody, and when you march around seven times, the wall falls down. Of course, of course, of course. It's the seven chakras, the seven nerve centers. Of course. But we take it literally, and so what do they do? People are looking. People are looking for Noah's Ark. It never happened. It's talking about... It took the story of a, of, of a tremendous flood, like we find all over, even on Mars, they're talking about they had floods, that... And it takes that and makes a story out of it, a mythology out of it. But it's talking about you. The ark is in here. So all of this. Stuff. So now we have the Bible telling us it's all symbolic. We have the Tel Aviv University telling us this stuff never happened. My God, it says here in the very first sentence, and this is from the USA Today, the Israeli archaeologist, the biblical history of the Jewish people is probably fiction. Of course, not fiction, mythology. It's true but in an inner spiritual way. So what have we found so far? What we've found is there's an encampment in the desert in the book of Numbers, chapter 2, and you have tribes positioned at the north, south, east, and west. And what we found in studying this is that it has nothing to do with the desert, just like it said there. Those, there's no history of tribes being in the desert. We found that the desert is your mind. And these are the four points. The four compass points are your four points. Emotions is the north. Spirit is the east. Physical is the south. And intellect is the west. Those are the four points. And then what we found in the story that the four points are identified with tribes. See? There's tribes. There are 12 tribes positioned. In the center here is the tabernacle or the temple. And we found by looking at the Bible that that's us. 
So this is talking about, not in the desert, it's talking about inside of us. There are 12 tribes inside of us positioned around the temple, which is the dwelling place of God in here. And the 12 tribes, we found are the 12 cranial nerves of the brain, the 12 cranial nerves which are attached to the brain. And each of the tribes had a sign, according to the book of Numbers. And we found that that sign of the 12 signs of the zodiac. So, of course, see? And, 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 and all of this stuff starts to make sense. And we were even able to position the tribe. See, a Jew is one inwardly. Well, at the east, at the point of the rising sun, the tribe of Judah camped. So what, that is the origin of the word Jew, Judah. And so what is a Jew? One who in their meditation dwells at the right side, the right hemisphere of the brain, by separating from thought, say. And we found Dan, the tribe of Dan is the emotions in because they camped in the north. The tribe of Ephraim, is that right? I believe is, no, I got that wrong. The tribe of Reuben is the south because they dwelled, they camped in the uh, south. And the tribe of Ephraim is the intellect. They dwelled in the west. So we start then by looking at the Bible differently and not considering these tribes not considering this the desert, but considering these to be the 12 cranial nerves of the brain, we can start to understand more of what, how does life really work? What is, what's going on? But, but who has ever bothered to take, to take a look at this and say, gosh, you know, uh, this means something very, very special to us. Now, the second significant thing, remember we learned was a Jew was not a person or a physical being, that's what it says in the Bible, but one who in meditation dwells at the East. And it's very important because then every time you see the word Jew in the Bible, it's not talking about people who live over someplace else. It's talking about the inside of you when in meditation you're dwelling at the East or the right side. When you look north, East is always on the right. So you're looking at the right side. And we're talking about the meditative state. We'll, we'll clarify that later. The third thing that we learned in the scriptures is circumcision is not a physical thing. It's not cutting the male organ, but actually is cutting away the thoughts of the mind. That's what it's talking about. That's what the Bible says. Circumcision is of the heart. You cut away the desire. See, the male organ is a symbol of desire, so that's why it's used mythologically to represent that. So you cut away the desires of the mind, then you're circumcised. It is separating from thought. Al Cruz came up to me at the end of last week and said, you know, is that the same as separating the wheat from the chaff? Exactly. The wheat is the spirit. The chaff is the intellect. You cut away. Is that the same as separating the, the, the sheep from the goats? Exactly. The sheep are the spirit. The goats are the intellect. So all of these things are basically... Stories that are based on the same theme, see? So then, the male being metaphysically the mind or the brain. The female, metaphysically, is the spirit and emotions. Male, mind, brain, spirit and emotions, female. So what does it have? You have to take a male Jew, and that male Jew has to be circumcised, meaning that you dwell at the right side, you're a Jew. You cut away the thoughts from the left side, you're circumcised. But it doesn't mean a man, because a woman also has spirit and emotions. And in addition to that, a woman has intellect, mind, and brain. So a woman has to be circumcised too. And a woman is circumcised how? By cutting away the desire of that which is the lower body or the flesh. Cutting away the desire of the mind. Cutting away the desires of the physical. So it is very, very important, and especially as it relates to women, because woman has been so degraded in so much of religion, and we have noticed this. Now, clearly, as I was putting this up here, let's real quick take a, take a quick look, and uh, I'll show you in, in overhead 184, which we saw last week, you see, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of the father's house. That's one of the 12 signs, because you've got 12 tribes. you got on the east, you got Judah. On the south, you got Reuben. On the west, you got Ephraim. 
on the north, you have Dan. And then it culminates all of this by saying that the number in the tribe of Judah, which is positioned at the east, at the right hemisphere of the brain, is 186,400. That's what it says there. Which is the constant speed of light. Which means this, this tribe of Judah, you and I, when we are Jews camping at the right side in meditation, are open to that which is the supreme light, which is that which comes down from above and touches us. So it all becomes very rational. It becomes extremely rational because, remember we had Tel Aviv University, said there's no, there's no evidence of any encampment ever happened. So then it means something. And look what it means. How wonderful it is to see what that means. And I want to show you something. What does this apply to? All of this inside of us. Our emotional state, our intellect, our physical, our spirit. What, is it, what does it relate to? It relates to the children of Israel. Okay, The children of Israel. Now, Israel is the key word here. You can take that. Okay. Israel is the key word. And you have Israel. Israel. That's the key word. Israel is not a place on the map. Israel is not a place over there in the Middle East where they, you know, shoot each other all the time. Israel is a condition of the mind. Israel is a condition of the brain. That's why the phrase children of Israel is so important. Okay? Because it's a condition of the mind. And that's what the Bible is trying to tell us using all these symbolisms. So where does that I-S come from? I-S is the female. It's Isis. In fact, if we put overhead 565 on, I think that's easier for you to see. Isis is female, the ancient Egyptian goddess of fertility. Okay, And that's where Isis, that's where that I-S comes from. Ra is the male. So now we're having something very interesting here. We don't have father god, do we? We have... Father and Mother God. And I'll tell you something. In ancient Hebrew religions, Father God is never Father. Never referred to as Father. That's a, that's a, a, a Western motif so that uh, it can be dominated by males and, and get control of you. So God here, that is male and female. See? So how do we know? we got Isra. Well, what we've done by taking the female and the West out of it, we've made God Ra'el. Just... God. See? So we have Ra male, and then we go down to here, which is El, which means God, Elohim. The names by which these are known, Yahweh or the Lord's name. The Lord is Elohim. So they take E-L, that's God. And so what do we have? We have Israel, the female and male God, and you become children of Israel when you are encamped around the tabernacle and dwelling at the right side which happens in your meditative state. When you go into meditation, you are camping at the right side, you separate from thought, meaning you're circumcised, and you're camping with the other, with the 12 tribes, which are the 12 cranial nerves, the 12 signs of the zodiac, around the center, which is the dwelling place of God, the temple not made with hands. And that's what this is about, see. So Israel means something else, which we have just seen. Just as the word Jew means something else, it means inside of you. Just as the word Jerusalem. Jerusalem, a place where there's nothing but bloodbaths over there. I mean, constantly fighting. What is Jerusalem? Well, we found that Israel means something else. The, The Bible use of the word Jerusalem has nothing whatsoever to do with a city over there where all that trouble is. Look at overhead B-189 where they're describing the allegory of Abraham and Sarah and Agar. Galatians, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is. In other words, the city that we read about every day in the papers. 
and is in bondage with her children. Well, in Jerusalem, right to this, to this day, they're in bondage to fear and hate and killing and violence. But look at the last verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. We're not talking about a town. See, if people go to the holy city, isn't this amazing? They go, I'm going to go over to the holy land. You know, well, you know, wear a bulletproof vest and a helmet, but I mean, you're going to the Holy Land. But they're not. Because you can't go to the Holy Land by taking a plane. You can't go there by taking a boat. You have to go there by taking meditation. Jerusalem is inside of you. And it is the mother of us all. Notice it. The mother. It is the Isis. It is the female. And what is in your brain that is the mother of us all? What is in your brain that is the spirit? It is what? The pia mater, the inner part of the brain. The holy place inside of you is called pia mater, which means tender mother. That's Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all. See? So you see there are two Jerusalems. The one outside where all the wars are fought, which is in bondage, and the Jerusalem, which is a state of mind. The feminine pia mater of the brain is the mother of us all, regardless of your religion. Jerusalem, the pia mater, is in atheists, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, doesn't make any difference, vegetarians, who cares? It's, everybody has it. Okay. And yet we fight and kill each other. Why? E each other over these things. Because we are taking stuff literally which this book has specifically said, don't do that. Because if you do, it kills. So, I mean, it becomes so obvious. All people have to do is become a little adult and start thinking, and this becomes very apparent. But if you're part of an organized religion, you're not allowed to be that way. You are required to check your brains at the door and sit there. And if they go like that, you get up. If they go like that, you kneel down. You get up, you go down, you do whatever you're told. And that's not the way this was intended. So remember now something else about Jerusalem and we'll move on. We said before there are 12 tribes gathered around the desert, which are the 12 cranial nerves, which are the 12 signs of the zodiac. How many gates are there in the heavenly city of Jerusalem? Let's look at overhead B190. It talks about it. Revelation, and he carried me away to the great high mountain, and he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. That's inside of you. Your brain, where Pia Mater dwells, and you have 12 cranial nerves, descending out of heaven, having the glory of God. Her light was like unto stone, like jasper, and there was a wall, great and high, with 12 gates. And at the gates were 12 angels. And the names were written, which are the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Do you understand this? It doesn't mean anything about Israel. It's not talking anything about that town or that place over there. It's talking about inside of you. <coughs> the children of the mother, father, God, Israel. The Jews who dwell at the right hemisphere of the brain in meditation. The Jerusalem which is the mother part of us all, the Pia Mater, the 12 gates, which are the 12 cranial nerves of the brain, which are the 12 signs of the zodiac, and all of these things interrelated inside of you are what this Bible is talking about. And so there's a few people sitting here. But the, the masses who, who flock to these places haven't a clue about this. They have no idea. To them, the holy city is Jerusalem. The temp you, know what the, you know what the big deal about the temple in Jerusalem is now? They're waiting for it to get blown up so the Jews can go take it away from the Muslims. I mean, they, they're going to kill each other over this thing, which is inside of everybody's head. So you've got soldiers with guns looking at the temple, and the temple is inside of themselves. And the scriptures are very clear about that. And why do you have 12 cranial nerves? And, you know, is that what they're talking about? Why do you have a holy mother, Pia Mater, inside of your brain? Of course. And the 12 angels are angles of light which interact with those 12 cranial nerves which create the new consciousness inside of you. And as we said, these 12 tribes are 12 personalities. 
and they're led by the fourfold nature of physical, emotional, spiritual, and intellectual. So you can take that down. What it has said to us is that the letter kills. So many wars have been fought that have killed so many people battling over interpretations of ancient texts which are totally misunderstood. People are flocking into churches by the millions today and listening to these things literally. And, and, and they don't understand. And it, and it simply brings up into them a need to uh, you know, get more missiles and guns to protect ourselves from these other people. And they're trying to get missiles and guns to protect themselves from you. Look at overhead B-182, just for a minute, Second Corinthians, saying here, even to this day, when Moses is read, that's the Old Testament, the veil is upon their heart, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. This is telling you, you're reading this stuff literally, and you're not seeing what it means. I mean, this is Greek mythology. I had a lady write to me and say, you are causing so much havoc because you are telling people that the Old Testament is Greek. Everybody knows it's a Hebrew book. I went right back to it. I said, 300 B.C., the Old Testament became a Greek document called the Septuagint. And it was written by Greeks, for Greeks, and that's why the Messiah has a Greek name, Jesus. And she never answered. And they never do. Because I don't say things unless, you know, you can document them. It's a Greek book. Old Testament and New Testament is Greek. But here it is being said, it has been a long time since the Old Testament texts relative to Moses were written, but even now, and this is 2,000 years ago, but I can tell you even now in the year 2002, people don't understand it when they read it. They're reading it literally. They take the text literally and they miss. And they don't realize that Moses is another mythological character who never lived. And that makes it very important and very true because Moses lives inside of you. He opens up the Red Sea. He opens up the way to the Promised Land, which actually is the movement across the strands of DNA. And I'll show that to you one of these days. We've already done that. They don't realize that there never was an exodus from Egypt. There never was anybody opening the Red Sea, even when the scientists from Tel Aviv University in the, in the middle of Israel saying it didn't happen, they can't deal with it. They want it to have happened. They don't realize that Abraham and Sarah were mythological figures. There was no King David. There was no King Solomon. Tel Aviv University said the same thing. They read the stories literally, and they totally miss the message that has come to them from the supreme light. And as a result, they come at each other with guns and missiles, willing to kill each other. I mean, when they crashed the plane into the World Trade Center, the people that were the hijackers had all their prayers. They had left their prayers. They discovered them. They're doing it in the name of Allah. And because they believed it. In the same way that we believe this stuff. And what do we believe? Do we believe the truth? We believe whatever we're told. We believe what somebody else told us. Our faith is not in God. Our faith is in the group that told us. So what does the story of Abraham and Sarah really mean? It's an allegory, it says in the Bible. How does it flow in a consistent manner with, with just what we've read, the nature of the Jew and the camping at the right side? And we'll look at Abraham and Sarah as the human mind as well. But before I do, I promised Joan that we would look at the story that has formed the basis of so much problem within the church and those of the ancient church, namely the boy love connection between Zeus and Ganymede. And, and that has really an unknowns to a lot of people, although they're starting to wonder, you know, how come uh, this has gone on for so long in the church with this boy love stuff. Um, well, the story, well, the story goes that God, or well, in this particular Greek myth, is Zeus, whoops, had a wife, and her name is Hera, and she had fallen. That's what it says. She was the cupbearer for the gods. Now, cupbearer can have a little different connotation in here, but anyhow, 
She was the cupbearer for the gods, and she fell. And this was the first instance where the male was starting to take over from the female. And so God really didn't want her, his wife, to be serving him or the gods anymore. So that was the end of the woman. And that where, you know, we, we continue to this day where, you know, women in some parts of the world wear bags over their heads and, you know, stuff like that. God looked down from heaven and saw this boy. And the boy was a real cute kid. And the boy's name was Ganymede. And God, Zeus, actually lusted after him. He said, this kid is really beautiful, and I'm in love with him. So God, or Zeus, swooped down in the form of an eagle and abducted the boy, took him up to Mount Olympus, which is heaven, to be his lover and the lover and cupbearer to the gods. It's the first, it's the first story of you know, a homosexual situation in the Bible. Now, we'll look at overhead 543, and we'll see the ancient painting here. And this is God in the form of an eagle taking the boy, Ganymede, off to Olympus. Okay. Now, if we look at overhead 544, we see a statue. And the statue is here of God, or Zeus, abducting the boy. You see, he's got him in his arm. He's taking him off. This is a picture later of Ganymede as a young man with the eagle, God. Now, you've got to keep in mind, and you can take that down, you've got to keep in mind the ones who wrote the story of God or Zeus abducting Ganymede, this little boy as a lover, are the same ones who wrote the story of God making a young girl pregnant so she could give birth to his son. And God, in this particular tale over here, he's not abducting a boy, but he is impregnating a young girl. So we got a young girl here. And the reason that he wants to get her pregnant is so that she can have his son so that he can kill him. Okay? Another mythological story of great import because it's talking about you. This is the cross right here. This is the top of the cross. This is the cross bars, and this is the bottom of the cross. The crucifixion of Jesus occurs inside of us. But the same people, Greek mythologists, wrote both stories. Okay. So we have the story of God lusting after this little boy and falling him in love with him, coming to earth disguised as an eagle and taking the boy off to be his lover. Well, in Greek and Roman cultures, this justified this problem of boy love, which we are seeing is so pre prevalent in religious circles. Now, people may say it's ridiculous. They go to church. They kneel before the story of God. You know, uh, I mean, you know, this is, this is a myth. This is ridiculous. God uh, having a, an affair with a little boy. That's horrible. That's blasphemy. But yet they'll go to church and kneel uh, uh, in front of the situation of God impregnating a girl and having this girl give birth to a son so he can kill him. That's okay because that's our belief. But there's something about Zeus as God that we have to first understand and consider, okay? So let's take a look at it. Because you see the thing, if you break these stories and if you begin to understand them, you start to realize for yourself that an invisible higher being has communicated these things to us and is telling us something that is vital for life. The grandparents in this story, not to Ganymede, okay, forget Ganymede, the little boy that gets abducted, but the grandparents to Zeus or God are Uranus, which is the grandfather, you call him Grandpa, and Gaia, which is the grandma. So we have grandmother and grandma. So in other words, Uranus is the constellation which is now in control of the universe. 
in the Aquarian age, and Gaia is the Earth. So this is the constellation, and this is the Earth. Okay. And they had two children, universe and Earth had two children, who in turn had a child, Zeus, God. So, you, and, you know, basically this becomes more of the same. Uranus and Gaia, the universe and Earth, intercourse as the universe and Earth do, and they give birth to Kronos. Okay? Kronos. Kronos is time. Kronos means time, chronology, so forth. Kronos means time. Now, in addition, they give birth to Rhea. The word Rhea means space. So we have time, space, the Earth, and the universe. See how good this is? How interesting it is when you begin to understand? This is a story about the, these things didn't exist. We're talking about. We're talking about the universe and the earth and your part in it. We're talking about time and space and your existence in it. Kronos and Rhea, time and space, is the basis of Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. See? So I mean, this isn't no far-fetched stuff here we're talking about. So you see how these stories parallel the biblical stories and do the same thing that the Bible told us. They use the name of people and places as symbols of the human mind, the human body, and the condition of existence in the universe. Now, as the story goes, time and space come together, which they do. And they have a baby, and the baby is Zeus, the Most High. Zeus is the Most High. Zeus is like Jesus. I mean, he's... The supreme light, the light of the world, okay, the most high. Mythology takes the liberty of placing these things in context for you. You live in time and space. You do. And within the time and space of your existence, you can also have born here inside of you the most high. That's what we're talking about. That's what the Bible's talking about. All these things talking in a little different way. Understand it that way. As the desert encampment is talking about your mind, this is talking about your existence. It's not talking about something that happened eons ago. It is talking about something that happens inside of you right now. Now, they had uh, other children, time and space. They had Hestia who's female. They had Demeter, who is soul or spirit, actually soul and spirit. In addition, they had Hera, wisdom, female, wisdom, remember? God, I eh, don't want that anymore. They had Hades, Male, hell, raises hell. They had Poseidon, water, truth. So we have female, we have male, we have soul, spirit, you have wisdom, you have truth. All related to time and space and to the supreme light. So it's all available for all of us. See? All available for all of us. Well, right after the birth of Hera, okay, wisdom, right after that happened, and she was born first, see, then came Demeter, which was the soul, then came um, wisdom. Uh, first, excuse me, first born was Hestia, which is the female. Then Demeter, the soul was born, then Hera, wisdom, and so forth. All of these things were born, Hades, the male, Poseidon, the truth. Kronos, which was time, swallowed them all. 
<laughs> like Pac-Man. He wants to swallow them all. And remember, this is mythological. So what happened? All of the elements of existence, all of the elements of existence that are applicable to us on this earth are consumed by time. Kronos thereby represents the male, has total control <coughs> or power over everything. It is the priest, <coughs> it is the pastor, it is the rabbi, it is who's ever in charge will tell you how a female should act, will tell you how a male should act, will tell you what the truth is, will tell you what wisdom is, will tell you what spirit is, because he has taken them all inside of himself. He would share them with anybody. Okay. All of the elements of existence are now consumed by time. All of the elements of existence are now consumed by the male, by the direction of that power inside. I've got all this stuff, and I have it, I have control of it, and I'll tell you what to do. No, no, I'm the king. So the earliest description comes to us here of the need for the male, Kronos, to rule over everything, to rule over the female, to rule over us, to rule and tell us what the truth is, to tell us what wisdom is, to tell us what the spirit is. It's going to be, you know, this is, this is the need that Kronos had. Nothing exists outside of the brotherhood. They swallow up everything. They control everything. Now, Rhea, which is space, universe, cosmos, spirit, she fears that Kronos, who has swallowed all of this, taken all of this for himself, is now going to take the supreme light, which is God, and swallow him. And she doesn't know what to do. He's going to take Zeus, and if Kronos or time, you know, that which we live in right here on earth swallows Zeus, then he's got everything, total control over everything. So Rhea went to Uranus. And Uranus, in Greek, the word Uranus means heaven. And she went to Gaia, which is the earth, heaven and earth. And Rhea, who is space, spirit, she asked for help. And heaven and earth... Uranus and Gaia, and remember now, Uranus is the controlling factor we have in, in this age. They say to her, take Zeus, take the child, wrap him in swaddling clothes, and take him to Crete. Out of the way, so Kronos can't get him. So she does. Sound like the story of Jesus going to Egypt? It's the same story. Take him away from King Herod. Same story. Same reason. See? And yet these things never happen. Please, you know, the hardest thing, try to remember, we're talking about that which is God within you. We're talking about your existence in time and space. We're talking about the existence of heaven and earth. We're talking about wisdom and truth and all of these things which are part of us. And, and, and we're talking about how are these going to be, how are these going to be returned to us? How they have been taken by this false leadership that we all kneel before on the earth. So they take the child to Crete. And in this particular case, Herod, in the, in the Jesus story, King Herod is Kronos. Mary, in this story, is Rhea. And Jesus, in the story, is Zeus. So, Upon the birth of Zeus, Kronos comes to swallow him because now, you know, time on this earth controls everything. He must control this supreme light, this child. Well, this child will overthrow him. So he comes to swallow Zeus. But Rhea gives him a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he swallows the stone. Now, what is this? This is the male force thinking he was taking into himself the universal power 
But in fact, he has been deceived. He actually swallowed a stone. And the universal power is safe from him. So all the while he is running around saying, this is it, I have the power, I am the representative of God on earth. He is deceiving himself. He's not, because he swallowed a stone. It's a picture of male-dominated religion thinking they have in truth, the truth within them, but in actuality, they have swallowed a stone. Hook, line, and sinker, as it says. Now, the prophecy here is interesting for you to look at. Gaia, the earth, and mitis, we, a new one enters in, M-E-T-I-S, which is divine wisdom. So we have Gaia, Mother Earth, and divine wisdom go to Kronos. Time. Get this now. Here, wisdom on the earth. Wisdom inside of you and me. Wisdom that we, understanding wisdom, enlightenment, can now confront Kronos, can now confront the ruling authorities uh, in time and earth. And these two, wisdom of the earth makes Kronos throw up. He pukes. Throws up. And he throws up that which he has been controlling. Does it look like the latest incident about all of this child abuse in the church is first signs of nausea? And so he throws up the female, he no longer can control her. He throws up the male, he no longer can control him. He throws up the spirit, he throws up wisdom, he throws up the truth. He doesn't have control of these things anymore. Because of what? Because of the wisdom that came to the earth that made the controlling elements on the earth throw these things up. Time is the controlling element of the earth and it, thro it no longer controls all of these things. So all of this now is a tremendous prophecy. That divine wisdom, which means comes when you become a Jew and you camp at the right side, this divine wisdom on the earth will make time or the controlling factors of the earth give up its power. And we're witnessing this right before our eyes. It's wonderful. You know, I have people nowadays, nobody trusts them anymore. No one bows down before them. Now, when you look at these religious people, they've got to have civilian review boards to make sure they're not messing around with little children. That's disgusting. I can't even conceive of it. it was a, you know, I'll show you, show you the, the, the depth of, of problems. One of the things that you know, I've been uh, having a problem with is you know, executing people, and, and uh, the Supreme Court just voted that it's illegal now to execute retarded people. Mentally retarded people. The scary, you know what the scary part about that is? Three of the justices said, no, it's not. It's okay. I mean, mentally retarded person. I have no idea what, this, what he's doing. Because we don't understand. But there was one other thing that Kronos threw up when he threw up all this other stuff. They've thrown up their power. He's now a mere mortal. He threw up the stone. That stone turned out to be the philosopher's stone, which is the small stone located in the center of the forehead area, the pineal gland of the brain. The stone the builders rejected, meaning the pineal, which is the light receptor of the body. Look at overhead B188. Unto you, therefore, 1 Peter 2, 7, he is precious, but unto them which have dis been disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed. Oh, you can't meditate. You can't activate the pineal gland. That's new age stuff. You'll open your mind to devils. That stone is made the head of the corner. That one place within the human body where that which is the supreme light enters is that stone. The stone which the builders, meaning religions, have rejected. And according to the mythologists, that stone 
was taken to Delphi and became the place where the oracle would sit on top of the tripod and give answers. Because the oracle represents that which is inside of you, which through the power of the descending angles of light to the pineal stone would then provide answers for your life. And Zeus, who is Jesus, vice versa, is the one who said in Matthew 6.22, if your eye be single, the stone, your body will fill with light. There's a real connection between Zeus and Jesus. We see that in the description of the birth and the involvement of both with that pineal stone which the builders rejected. So we see Zeus's origin. And then we go on to the story. His abduction of Ganymede into a homosexual or boy love relationship with Ganymede. And the players in this drama are Zeus, a form of Jesus, Ganymede, a boy child, a male child. The child is one who has not formed an opinion. The child is one who has not formed a tradition. The child is one who has not formed a doctrine, has not formed a religion. This, all of this stuff is placed into the child. The male represents the mind. The female represents the spirit and the emotion. So we have a male child. We have a mind that has not been polluted by religion. A mind that has not been taught the hate, the fear, the guilt, the violence of religions and governments. We have a mind that has not been polluted by traditions and doctrines. And we have Zeus, or God, desiring to have that unpolluted mind. Zeus, or God, desires that our minds are free from the stain of all of this stuff, as open to truth and love, not conditioned by the pollution of the adult male, the polluted mind. Not conditioned by the adult female, the emotions or the, or the spirit. So keep in mind, now male and female are only symbols. So God in this story desires the mind that is free of this pollution of carnal thought. And that's what the basis is. It has nothing to do with homosexuality. It has nothing to do with boy love. It has nothing to do with sex of any kind. It's exactly the same with the Virgin Mary. The person never existed as a human being. It is virgin consciousness, unpolluted by the thoughts of the lower mind. It's the same story. It's a variation on the same theme. So God swoops down, disguised as an eagle, to carry the boy Ganymede off. Disguised as an eagle to take this child. And how does he do this? Look once again, real quick, 544. And you see... He swoops, and he takes the boy off, 543, that other one there. He takes the boy off disguised as an eagle, which you see there. See? The eagle is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit which swoops down and takes the child within us, the part of us that is not polluted with tradition, religion, doctrines, and all of that stuff, and takes us up to Mount Olympus to be lover and cupbearer to the God. Flying through the mind from the highest realms of nature, the electromagnetism, which is intelligent under the control of intelligent beings. Alala, A-L-A-L-A, is the eagle who represented the great spirit. And the scripture in the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They that are in meditation, dwelling at the right side, will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings of eagles. You see, Ganymede is you and me in meditation. God sees us, loves this part of us. And the eagle of the Holy Spirit, the electromagnetism of God comes to us and takes us to the high mountain of consciousness. This is the story of the child Ganymede. Mount Olympus is the, the place of the height of perfection. It was the Greek poet Homer who placed the two extremes as Earth, the lower mind, and Olympus as the higher mind. And so God took Ganymede to be the water bearer. Remember, a member of the family of Kronos and Rhea was Poseidon, the water, the sea, truth. Very important to understand this. Kronos, the male physical religion, swallowed Poseidon to try to control truth for himself. But now he's been forced to throw it up as we're all looking at this. But the unpolluted mind of meditation is taken by God or the Holy Spirit to Olympus, the place of the higher consciousness, and there we are the water bringers. We are then those that are the bringers of truth. 
In other words, the child is instructed in truth via the unpolluted mind of meditation. Thus, the child is bringing water to the gods. The truth of God is being carried by the child. So the little child is now carrying God's truth. And then what happens? When the child matures inside of us as we grow in this meditation with God, we become what? We become a constellation. Mythologically, we become Aquarius. We become the water bearer. We then become those who are giving water out. We then become those who are bringing the truth to people. The meditation, as we are maturing by waiting, we are dwelling in the place of the water. We are dwelling in the place of the supreme truth. And as we mature, we become the adult male with, the, with, with, with that which is the pitcher of water. We now carry the truth outside of ourselves to the world. That's God's plan. That's the beautiful secret of the spirit of the human mind. And that's what has been misinterpreted. And to the extent that has been used as a justification for these animals in Coracle collars to molest little children. Oh, well, God did it. So we are in meditation. As we mature in meditation, we are then able to provide the truth to those outside. That is the story of Ganymede and Zeus. It is the story of God in all of us. Okay. Are we uh, done? I guess we are, because I don't have any more stuff. What is that? No, that's okay. We're fine. Okay, we'll see you then. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.